Good morning, everyone. Welcome to chapel. I'm thrilled that you are here. Before we get started, it's kind of a dreary day, and I feel like we are all kind of sleepy, but I want to do something. I want us to put our hands out like this, and I want us to take some deep breaths, and then we're going to pray alongside taking those deep breaths, centering prayer, okay? I want you to breathe in and say, Lord, you are good. To yourself, sorry, to yourself. Don't, don't out loud. That will ruin the moment. <laughs> Internally, say, Lord, you are good. And then exhale, and I love you. Okay? Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. And breathe out. Father, we pray that you'd teach us. I pray that you'd guide us. Because, Lord, you are good and we trust you. Okay, you can open your eyes. I may not have the build for it, but while I was in college, I studied jujitsu. Okay, that's hurtful. I got to laugh. All right. All right. I see you guys. A little cruel on Monday morning. That's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll prevail. So, um, I, I, I did this, I grew up doing martial arts, I grew up uh, like three or four times a week, we would be thrown into a class, I think it was my mom's way of just going, get out of the house, I'll pay somebody just to like let you run around mats for a while, um, just get out, and so I studied martial arts for a number of years, like 15 years, and then when I went to college, a form of martial arts, specific one, jiu-jitsu, really interested me, and so um, I, I found a gym, a really reputable gym in downtown Chicago, and I just started studying there. Uh, I bought my gi, a very heavy-duty gi, uh, which like weighed, it felt like it weighed a thousand pounds, but it couldn't tear for anything, and that's what I needed. And so we'd go and show up to this gym, my buddy and I, and we'd show up, um, and, and it was me, uh, a, a couple other white belts who started. They had like officially gotten their white belt, and then there was like a bunch of brown and black belts and stuff like that. And so we just showed up kind of green, and I had done a little bit of jujitsu growing up, like not much, but I had done a little bit enough to know what was kind of of going on, and we showed up, uh, uh, and for our first introductory class, the black belt, the instructor, uh, sat us all down on the mat, and he goes, you don't know anything. I was like, wow, okay, really? Right. A little strong off the top, that's fine. And he goes, if you think you know something and you try it on the mat, you will injure both yourself and your teammate." Okay, sounds good. So we get out on the mat. We got a little pep talk for the, you know, entire time that we're there. We get out on the mat. And what I found was actually it was really true. And it wasn't that I didn't know anything. I did know a little bit. But what, was, what I found to be true is that I was far safer wrestling a black belt than I was a white belt. I was far safer wrestling someone who knew everything there is to know, who knew every possible way to get me to submit, who could inflict pain on my body in ways I did not even fathom. I was like, oh God, that's a muscle. But it was, it was. I didn't know there was a pressure point there, but I, he found it. And so I found that the most dangerous people to wrestle were fellow white belts because they'd go like, I saw this on YouTube. They try to throw you in a Kimura or a knee lock or an ankle lock and you'd like, You'd be inches, centimeters away from like breaking your knee and being done. And so the black belt would come by and he'd go, okay, you, there are some moves you are never allowed to try until you get to this level. You are never allowed to do this, this, or this. I don't care how many YouTube videos you've watched. I don't care how many UFC fights you've seen. There is no way that you can do this, this, or this, even if you think you know what you're doing, because you might know what you're doing, but then once it gets real, and then once it actually starts to happen, you will injure those around you. And so time and time again, what he would remind us, youngins in, in uh, uh, the, the school, he would remind us, you don't know anything. You are far less sufficient than you think. 
And I had the battle scars to prove it. I, I uh, uh, would go to this gym, and then I'd go back to class. I'd do like two or three classes in a row, and then I'd go back to uh, uh, like my dorm and stuff like that. And there were a number of times I, I went back home with like a swollen lip. I had two black eyes. I was like bleeding down the side. I'm like limping, you know. And like there was one time I woke up, and I couldn't move my neck. Uh, it was because I was wrestling white belts. They were just trying things. And like one time this dude just kicked me in the face. I was like, bro, that's not what we're doing. That's not our sport. Um, but people were, then my professors were kind of like, is there something, are you okay? Like, is Aaron your roommate, you know, is, is he fine? And I was like, yeah, honestly, he's fine. I mean, he didn't do this to me, but somebody did. And um, they're wondering, you know, did you get mugged? And I said, no, it's Chicago, but we're fine. Um, but the thing that was ingrained into my memory was that this teacher had to lead me to the edge of myself, had to show me I did not actually know anything, this teacher was a good teacher and had to lead me to see that I was actually helpless on the mat. And I needed him to teach me. And I needed to sit under and learn and try it and then fail and then learn. Because in my helplessness, he was actually able to teach me. So that's what we're going to see a little bit today. So if you have your Bibles, open them. We're in Mark chapter 6. We are in Mark chapter 6. We're continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark that is very appropriately just titled the Gospel of Mark. Nothing fancy, nothing here, because Mark doesn't give us anything fancy. He just kind of attacks the problem. He's very direct, and he goes, this is what happened, and then this is what happened, and then this is what happened, and then this is what happened. Do you know about this guy, Jesus, and he did this, and this, and this, and this, and this. There's not a whole lot of frills. There's not a whole lot of pomp and circumstance. He just attacks and attacks and attacks. And so in Mark chapter 6, we're going to see a couple things that are really Really interesting in the life of Jesus, but they're going to be really profound for our study today because we are going to see that Jesus leads us to the end of ourselves and that's where he begins. Jesus drives you to see your helplessness, your inadequacy, and that's where he begins. So Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 30 says, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. So to review, they said he returned. Returned from where? So a little while ago, like a couple paragraphs ago, Jesus took his disciples, gathered them around, and he said, okay, everything that you've seen me do, I want you to go and do. Everything you've seen me teach, I want you to go and teach. He's a master teacher, and so he goes, you need to go out from me. You need to teach and do everything that you've seen me do. They're like, everything? He goes, yes, everything. Even the miracles? Even the miracles. Even like, can we steal your sermons? He goes, yes, steal my sermons. Just go out and teach and do everything that you've done. And so they have been out for quite a while now. Uh, and, and that's what they've been doing. So they are returning to Jesus after this time. He said that they couldn't bring anything. They couldn't bring a bag. They couldn't bring any bread. They couldn't bring uh, uh, supplies. They couldn't bring any money. They had to be sent out, and then they are just now returning. And so, verse 31. And so Jesus said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. These guys are tired and hungry. So he goes, all right, so let's go away and let's rest a little while. You've been telling me all these things. I'm exhausted from just hearing your stories. There's like 12 of you and that's just exhausting. Have you ever heard anyone come back from like a vacation? You're like, okay, we get it. There were some sweet photos. It's like Jesus here. I'm sure he would care about your photos too. So um, he says, okay, come to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure to even eat. So they're sitting around at a table, right? They're sitting down, and Jesus is like, okay, tell me your stories. And they're like, okay, wow, we're super tired. And people keep coming up. This text is painting a picture of people consistently coming up to Jesus, coming up to the disciples, and like bothering them in the middle of their meal. And so he goes, okay, we don't have time to even eat right now. We don't have the ability to even eat right now. Let's go someplace and rest. Verse 32, and they went away 
in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So they get into a boat, and they're like rowing to the other side of the lake. And some people are going like, hey, Jesus is getting into the boat. And he's like, yes, to leave you. And they're like, okay, we're going to just marathon man this mess to the other side. And so Jesus gets there, shows up, and he's like, ugh. Verse 34, when he went to shore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like a sheep, they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. So I want us to notice a little something here about what this text is driving at. So Jesus gathers the disciples together. The disciples start telling their stories. Uh, people are consistently coming up and saying, hey, can we talk to you? And he's like, okay, we need to get away in order to actually meet, in order to have a meal, in order to talk about what you did, in order to debrief your time. And so they get into a boat to get away from the crowds and they go and they leave to go somewhere else. People run around to the other side of the lake to meet him there so that when they get, when they finally arrive, Jesus steps off and there's like this huge crowd waiting for him. And what's his response? If it was me, I know my response would be very different. What's his response? His response is compassion. His response is compassion. It's a, it's a peculiar Greek word. It's the Greek word, um, splachizomai. And so it's kind of like he was moved in his bowels. He was moved into the seat of affection. You're like, bowels? Yes, honestly, that's, the, like, that's literally what it is. It's like bowels, like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus had bowels. Okay, let's get over that. So um, he was moved into the seat of his emotions. And there's, a two, there's two movements here. One, he noticed the issue and he was moved. And two, he was moved to the point of action. And so here is part of what I, I want us to drive home during our short time this morning. One, is your picture of Jesus one of a compassionate one? Or do you assume Jesus is a lot like you, and when you're bugging him, he's kind of annoyed? That when you think he's trying to get away, and he steps foot on land, and, he, and you're like there like, <laughs> hi, Jesus. That he's like, oh, God, would she just leave me alone? Is your picture of Jesus one of compassion? I think we know, like, intuitively, we're like, yeah, 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 that's how Jesus is supposed to operate. Like, we, we get, like, okay, he's the nice, docile one, right? Like, we don't really understand what compassion really means. And so when we come to Jesus, we have these dual thoughts. We're like, you're supposed to be compassionate, but I'm expecting you to, like, divinely hit me kind of a thing. You're supposed to be compassionate, but I'm expecting you to give me a whole host of shame. You're supposed to be compassionate, but I'm expecting to have to bear your anger. You're supposed to be compassionate, but the fear that I feel is, is real and it's not going to go away. You don't want it to go away because of something. Is your picture of Jesus compassionate? I'd say by the way that we engage each other on social media, we believe our Jesus is very angry and we believe our Jesus is very antagonistic and we believe our Jesus does not actually care about people. He only cares about issues. He is only driven by fear. He is not driven by any kind of compassion. If there's anything that I saw in the last week, there was a major Senate hearing, right? The anything that I saw in the last week, it's that some people would show up on social media and they'd say something very, very strong. And then the other side would say something very, very strong. And then that side would say something even stronger. And then the other side would say something even stronger. And then the issue is neither of these people are actually talking they're not actually talking towards each other. They're looking back at their followers and they're saying, oh yeah, this thing. They say this very, very strong thing. And they're only saying it so that their followers go, oh my gosh, you're so brave. Oh my gosh, why are you saying this thing? Of course you're brave. You're only saying it to the people who like you. 
Then if somebody does say something against you on your social media, you're like, oh, this is persecution. I knew this would come. I knew that there was the ignorant, dumb people on my Facebook. I should just get off. You're being all melodramatic. And you're just going, okay, I don't really want to be around here. If you're not going to listen. There were some devastating things said in the last week alone. But if you weren't listening to the other side, if you weren't listening to even your people, if you weren't listening at all, if you were just listening to refute, not listening to understand, you're part of the problem. And it probably shows you don't believe your Jesus is compassionate. It probably shows that you believe your Jesus is a warrior to charge into battle, to just vanquish your foes because you've identified them as your foes. When actually they are people that Jesus desperately loves and pursues and cares about. It doesn't mean that we, it doesn't mean that we just overlook issues. It doesn't mean that we just not have this discussion. But it might mean that Jesus loves them far more than you think they do. Than you think that he does. And your anger and your vitriol and your attacks and your persecution complex that you have actually betrays you do not believe that Jesus is compassionate to other people, which probably means you don't believe he's compassionate towards you. Where you would respond in anger and fear, where you would respond with hesitancy about the future. Oh no, what are we becoming as a country? What are we becoming as a generation? What are we becoming as a people? While you respond towards fear at those things, I believe Jesus responds with compassion. And that should probably affect the way that we engage on social media, you think? Let's stop talking to everybody who disagrees with us. You want to know? You want to know why? I. You want to know why? How does that make you better? Number one. Number two. When you sit in this echo chamber, how do you engage anything outside? You're getting dumber just talking to the same people over and over again. Number three. How do you become more compassionate? How do you become more loving? Yeah, 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 but they're the ones who aren't loving. Stop pointing the finger. You're part of the problem. Jesus responds with compassion. You know how I know? Because even in the midst of your angry posts, even in the midst of your incredulity, even in the midst of your impossible standard that you set for others that you don't hold yourself to, he responds with love and care and grace towards you. And so Jesus has a feeling that moves him towards action. He has a feeling of love and affection that moves you, that, that, that he engages you and moves into action to love, care, and serve you. The reason I know that he has love for that person that I disagree with on Facebook, on Twitter, on whatever, is because I know that he loves me, and I'm a pretty miserable person, right? Everyone's like, amen. Amen. You've been talking about social media for like 10 minutes. God, you are miserable. Let's continue moving. Verse, what are we on, 35? Verse 35. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place and the hour is late. Send them away to go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And you probably see a couple different things happening here. The disciples are tired. They haven't gotten a break. So while Jesus is teaching these masses that he has compassion on, they're probably looking at their watches waiting for like the Lord Jesus to get done. Like this is kind of a long sermon, Jesus. Like they're all getting, t- we, they, someone's getting tired here. Someone's getting hungry. So you should probably let them go to the surrounding like countrysides and all that stuff. Let them buy food because, you know, we're, we're fine. But you need to let them go because they, you know, just please be quiet kind of a thing. But then Jesus answered them, verse 37. Jesus answered them. You give them something to eat. And, and, in, and in the language, it, it, you don't have to like do a whole ton of work here to see the emphasis on you. You give them something to eat. 
you give them something to eat. And they said to him, well, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? Now, this is actually really sarcastic. This is like the most disrespectful and sarcastic that you see the disciples be towards Jesus in really any of the Gospels. And there's, none, there's no other moment like this in any of the other Gospels that are recorded. And so they're like, okay, do I, am I supposed to take 200 days' wages? Denarii is a day's wage. Am I supposed to take 200 days' wages and just go out and, and just buy a bunch of bread? Do you, do you see the sarcasm here? Let me... Let me Show you, Jesus had just told them to take no money and go and preach the gospel and come back. And so they don't have any money. So they're like, uh, Jesus goes, uh, you, you feed them. You get them something to eat. And they're like, well, do I have 40 grand? Did I remember bringing 40? Andrew, you got 40,000? Peter, where did you put? Are you just going to pull out like a stack of cash? Like, oh yeah, I have my $40,000 here. I'm sorry, I forgot about it. I took it with me, didn't even think about it. Not my bad, Jesus. He goes, you give them something to eat. They respond very sarcastically. Jesus, they're hungry. Okay, you feed them. No, 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 um, for real. I mean, I mean they're, they're hungry. Yeah, 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 yeah. You feed them. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. I love he tells him to go check. It's, again, another really interesting moment in this gospel because they're probably like, there's not enough for them. I know that, Jesus. I didn't just, like, have 40 grand worth of food sitting in, like, the boat that we just happened to look over. And he goes, go and see how much you actually have. And so they come back, and they said, uh, we have five loaves and we have two fish, which isn't enough for 12 grown men, right? So they go, like, we, we don't have enough food for us, Jesus. And then... He says, anyway, go and see. I love that he tells them to go and see. I love that he tells them to go take stock in what they have done, what, what they have. I think the disciples assume that Jesus is telling them, no, 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 you need to go and fix the problem. Yet you named the problem, you named that there's an issue, people are hungry, and disciples, you need to go and fix the problem. So they go like, oh, we only have five loaves and, and two fish. And they feel the pressure of the crowd. They feel that their task is impossible. And they think that they are on their own to solve this impossible, impossible task. You know that because they respond sarcastically, right? But Jesus is doing something really interesting here. He's frustrating them in the same way that he frustrates us. He's showing them that they are absolutely helpless. He is, show, he is bringing them to the edge of themselves. They just came off of like a killer teaching circuit. They just came off of like packed stadiums, packed crowds, people saying their name kind of a thing. They were healing people, and their egos are getting pretty big. And all of a sudden, they show up. They go, hey, Jesus, they're hungry. Jesus goes, you feed them. They go like, with what? How are you going to feed them? And he goes, you feed these people. And they go, we can't feed these people. We have five loaves and two fish. And Jesus goes, exactly. Because Jesus is not interested in their strengths. His kingdom is not built by strength. Because your strength is an illusion. You're not nearly as strong as you think you are. And then this is the most loving thing that Jesus can do. And we'll see why in a second. Verse 39. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And, by, and, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, said a blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. He divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. And so this is more than just them like getting like a little communion snack, you know what I mean? Where they give you like the little bitty piece of bread, you know? This is more than just that kind of a thing. Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fish. And it seems like this is a really, really cute scene, you know what I mean? Every time I've seen this like depicted in Sunday school, we had to like color in the lines, which I never was very good at. Um, it would be like this really cute picnic that everyone would like sit down at. And Jesus is like handing out tuna sandwiches, like you get a tuna sandwich, and you get a tuna sandwich, and you get a tuna sandwich. People are like, oh my gosh, we love tuna sandwiches. 
Sanchez. This is incredible. But it's not that. It's not quite that scene. It's actually the disciples are really angry and frustrated, and Jesus is still doing the miracle. Using what? He sends the disciples out again to do the miracle that they did not think was actually possible at all. Which is really curious to me because they've been seeing Jesus do miracles time and time again before they've gotten to this point. They themselves have done miracles. But Jesus is bringing them to the point of helplessness and they are angry about it. And they are angry about it. Let's continue, verse 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on sea, and he was alone on land. So, the crowds are there. He goes, all right, now get into the boat. Go again to the other side. Hopefully nobody runs after you kind of a thing. And then he goes, I'm going to stay here and dismiss the crowds. And I'm going to go up to a mountain to pray. So while they're out there, Jesus goes up to a mountain to pray. Uh, verse 48, and he saw that they were making headwind, he headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, 3 a.m.-ish, he came to them walking on the sea. And he meant to pass by them. That evokes language, but just as a side note, that evokes language from the Moses story where God passed by Moses. It's not like Jesus was like watching them in the boat. And he's just like, hey guys, yeah, I'm going to go over here now. And it wasn't that kind of a thing. Um, he meant to show them something. He meant to show them something. Verse 49. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Or, translated differently, I am. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. Now pay attention. And they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand the loaves. But their hearts were hardened. They were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. It's possible for you to see a miracle of Jesus. These disciples did. And for you to respond with, whoa, and a hard heart at the same time. It's possible for you to see some incredible, miraculous thing happen, and for you to go like, wow, that's pretty neat. I don't want any part of it. It's possible for you to see God do some unreal things in your own life, and for you to go like, wow, that was incredible. That was miraculous. I am astounded. I am utterly astounded. And then at the same time, you convince yourself that you are the one who brought that about, or that you are the one who... And your heart is hardened towards the Lord. So listen, let, let's, let's drive this home. Jesus consistently is showing the disciples how weak they actually are. He's showing the disciples how helpless they actually are. And are they thankful for that kind of a lesson? Not quite. Unless we look at the disciples and go like, how could you? You were like standing next to Jesus. We do the exact same thing. Jesus shows us and we wake up in the morning and we like rise out of bed. And the first thought that we have is when is our nap, right? Is that just me? Okay. I'm alone in that one. Okay. And we see how weak we actually are. We look at a problem and we see how weak we actually are. We look at our grades and we do the math and we see how weak we actually are. 
We feel our frailty, our insecurity. We feel the weight of the world. We feel that we cannot fix our friendships, our families, our grades. Our car keeps breaking down. Our bills never get paid. And we look and we see how weak we actually are. You know how we respond? We respond with hard hearts. We're just going to grit it out. We're just going to keep moving forward. If the Lord won't give this to me, I am going to make it happen. And the most cruel thing that Jesus could do for you is to step back and go, okay, you make it happen. But Jesus creates a circumstance, like these are two absolutely unnecessary miracles. These are two miracles that don't, they they weren't necessary. No one was dying, no one was sick, no one was starving. The disciples were just a little tired, and they were just a little hungry, and they were just a little frustrated. So Jesus creates a scenario for them to see the end of themselves. So listen, what is your scenario that Jesus might be creating in you, where the purpose is for you to see? the end of yourself, but you are responding with, I can do this, I can figure it out, I can make it happen, and Jesus is going, you're missing the point entirely. You are seeing me work miraculously in your life, and you are missing the point entirely. And now notice something. This is where I'll close. Notice something. The text said they were rowing. It was really difficult. They see Jesus just like, hey guys, what's up? And They are afraid because they think it's a ghost. Jesus goes, hey guys, I'm not a ghost. Don't be afraid. It says he climbed in the boat and their hearts were hardened. Listen, some of you in this room have incredibly, incredibly hard hearts. It might be to the Lord. It probably is to the Lord. It might be to someone around you. It might be manifesting itself with someone around you. It might be manifesting itself with your sphere of influence. It might be manifesting itself as just anger that you feel towards a political party or to someone that you don't even know, but you know him or her is existing in the ether somewhere. It might be anger towards... It, you might have a hard heart towards someone around you. And this is the kindness and the compassion of Jesus. The kindness and the compassion of Jesus is that even in the midst of your hard heart, he climbs in the boat with you. So what are we to do with this? What are we to do with this passage? What are we to do with our hard hearts? Jesus is sitting in the boat next to them, and yet they're going, I don't think I'm for this. I don't understand the loaves. I don't understand this miracle. I don't understand. I don't think I'm for this. And yet Jesus exists alongside of them. So Judson, my Judson family. Jesus loves you to the point that even if you have a hard heart towards him, even if you have an off Monday, even as you have hardships, even as you respond negatively, even as you are in the middle of your relationships and you are being kind of a tool. Jesus climbs in the boat with you to speak compassion and love and grace to you. He has not given up on you. He sits with you. So may we as a community, may we know that our God is compassionate. May we know it is grace that Jesus leads us to the end of ourselves, that Jesus leads us and exposes our helplessness. And may we know that even in our hardest of hearts, even in, even in our coldest of days, Jesus climbs into the boat with us and just sits with us to speak love and compassion and grace and affection. I love you all. You are dismissed.